God is great and greatly to be praised. Today, we welcome you to the bridge. I'm Pastor Lance Watson, and we are beginning a new study in the book of Romans that will take us across the next six weeks. This study is entitled, as my backdrop indicates, More Than Conquerors, because that's the calling on our lives as people of faith. We will end in chapter eight, but first I want to lay the groundwork for us to understand how Paul guides us to the conclusion. So today we're going to look at how to develop a conquering attitude. Can I get 82 of you to type attitude? And while you're doing that, go ahead and download the student outline that's pinned as a link in the chat space and hit the share button to share this study with somebody else. People of great achievement are usually people of special attitudes, a study of those whose lives uh, are great and achieve great things, whose actions have changed the course of human experience will show that they achieved what they did because they believed deeply in what they were doing and thought uniquely about the lives that they were living. Paul the Apostle, formerly Saul of Tarsus, was one such a man. Without him, a message of the risen Christ could have conceivably found its place among the little-known legends of the Middle East and been relegated to the position reserved for stories of fancy, loved by poets and romantics, but largely ignored by people of action and purpose. But to a great extent, because of Paul's life, this was not to be. From one end of the Roman Empire to the other, he traveled preaching, teaching, founding churches, instructing leaders, nurturing the faltering, rebuking the disorderly, organizing, sustaining, challenging, and comforting those who believed. Wherever he went, people believed, and groups of remarkably dedicated disciples were formed, and with unbelievable speed and effectiveness, the church of Jesus Christ was taken from the position of a troublesome sect in Judaism to a lively force of committed people throughout the known world. From Paul's fertile mind and fluid pen flowed letters of abiding value, inspired as they were by the Holy Spirit, they have become the basis for preaching and teaching in much of the Christian church, across centuries where Paul has been taught, cultures have been changed. In places where churches stand and speak for the lifestyle, 
provided by Jesus Christ and broadcast by Paul, society shows the indelible imprint of this incredible apostle. More than any of us may ever realize, our lives have been touched and transformed not only by Jesus Christ, the Son of God, but also through the converted Pharisee, the proud son of Tarsus, the Apostle Paul. What were the motivations and attitudes that drove him? Here we're getting to it. Where did he find his vision and revive his spirit? In the opening verses of the Roman epistle, we find some of the clues to these questions. So go with me to Romans chapter one, verse one. This is how it reads. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. Now it was customary in first century correspondence to commence with the writer's name, to state the name of the recipient, and then to bring greetings. But Paul did this and much more. For in between the traditional and the formal, Paul, a servant to all who are in Rome, grace to you and peace, he wrote much that presents fascinating glimpses for us into his heart and mind and allows us to learn a lot about his personal attitude. And there are four things in particular to which I'd like to direct your attention. Because first we see his realistic appraisal of himself. You've got to see yourself right or nothing else is seen right. It was first during his first missionary journey to Northern Africa with Barnabas that the apostle became known as Paul rather than Saul. And while some people see this change in name as an expression of humility, wrought in the proud Pharisee by the risen Lord, it is more likely that he adopted his Roman name as one by which he wanted to be known to facilitate his travels throughout the Roman Empire, a practice that was not uncommon in those days. Notice his careful use of the words, a servant. Everybody say servant. A servant of Jesus Christ. In verse one, it's without clear doubt, a statement of humble attitude and deep devotion, because Paul saw himself as one obliged to serve Christ as a servant and as a person without exclusive rights to his own life, but as one who had been bought with a price and would seek to glorify God in his body. If Paul had not seen himself in this life, but had concentrated more on his own rights, his own desire, his own privilege, it's highly unlikely he would have accomplished what he did. Because times without number, his circumstances dictate that he should think of his own safety and well being. Yet he pressed on with phenomenal determination and total disregard for himself for no other reason than he believed he was not his own master. He was a servant of the one who had never drawn back, even from a cross. If there's a ring of humility in the use of the word servant, there's a balancing note of authority in the next phrase, called to be an apostle. Everybody say apostle. The status of apostle was something to which Paul held tenaciously. He knew that in that role, he had the responsibility of founding churches in areas where Christ was unknown and Therefore, he had to speak not only with authority, but to be seen as one with authority. When he dealt with problems, when he encountered error, he did not hesitate to remind his readers and hearers that they would disregard what he was saying at their own peril. Because they were dealing, he assured them, not with a run-of-the-mill itinerant preacher, but with a divinely chosen apostle. To Paul, Listen to this third word, being called. Everybody say called. 
meant being selected and commissioned for the task by God himself. We should not overlook his delightful balance and his selection of words. If he had spoken exclusively of himself as a servant, he would have been disregarded by the rebellious and discounted by the skeptical. But if he had thundered constantly concerning his apostleship, the timid would have been terrified. He was the servant leader, the servant apostle, who was called to live in the challenging tension between personal humility and derived authority, in which to a lesser extent, every Christian is called to live. Paul had a sharply defined sense of destiny. He firmly believed he was separated to the gospel of God. And there is a sense in which the word separated can and should relate to human actions, such as the consecration of a building for a special purpose or ordination of a person to a specific ministry. Paul was separated or ordained along with Barnabas to the special ministry of outreach beyond the Jewish community by the Holy Spirit at Antioch. But this separation was not specifically what Paul has in mind here, because writing to the Galatians, he said that his separation was from his mother's womb, an act that only God could accomplish. His conviction was that God had set him apart, yet been separated from the day of his birth to preach the gospel of God to people. And this meant, of course, that he looked at his heritage, education, personality, and gifts as being a part of God's plan. Can I stick a pen right there and tell you everything you have and everything you are is a part of God's plan for your life? While Paul never recovered from the horror of his own abuse of privilege and the consequences of the mistakes he made before he came to Christ, he saw even in those events factors that equipped him to make the gospel known. To Paul, it was no accident that he had Roman citizenship, Greek culture, and Jewish training. God had separated him, ordained him, called him from the womb. The earliest days spent in cosmopolitan Tarsus, his student days at the feet of Gamaliel, the turbulent days invested in a burning desire to eradicate the mistaken followers of Jesus of Nazareth had not only left their scars, but they had built into his character the very traits that would send him and the gospel to people living in ignorance of the salvation of God provided through Jesus Christ. For Paul, no tantalizing horizons beckoned, no long cherished dreams drew him forward. He was a one goal person. Everybody say one goal. With fierce intensity and unshakable determination, he knew himself to be a man fashioned by God for a formidable task in the extreme yet glorious, that was extreme and yet glorious in its purpose. Far from being overwhelmed, Paul demonstrated his sense of adequacy under the most trying circumstances and in the most discouraging situations. This deep-rooted sense of competence came from his understanding that he had received grace and apostleship, as verse 5 testifies. His apostleship, as we pointed out, was the position of privilege and responsibility the grace was the divine enabling for the task at hand. Grace was one of Paul's favorite words, and we'll discover over and over again throughout this study that he used it in a variety of ways, but always with the thought that it was the gift of God to those who did not deserve it. So to the apostle, it meant that along with the awesome responsibility that came with the role, he had been given by God everything it would take to fulfill the responsibility. Where God guides, God provides. What God calls you to, God equips you for. It was during World War II that Winston Churchill sent a cable to then President Franklin Delano Roosevelt and said concerning the war, give us the tools and we'll finish the job. Well, using that, God had cable Paul and said, I'm giving you the tools. Grace, not finish the job, apostleship. 
The extent of that job was made clear to Paul, even as brave Ananias came to him in Damascus after his transformative encounter with the risen Christ. As Christ ministered to the stricken Saul, Ananias then made it clear that the new apostle was to go as God's chosen instrument to the Gentiles. To Paul, this simply meant a ministry among the nations. From the early days in Damascus, into Arabia, Sicily, and Syria, he had seen people who needed Christ come to know him. On to Asia, Macedonia, and Galatia. Galatia, he moved relentlessly, ranging by any means available, moving by any means available from one region to the next with a great goal that all nations would be brought before Jesus Christ. Now, at the time of this writing, he was planning not only to press westward to Rome, but to go on into Spain. Wherever he went, his objective was the same, to bring people to the obedience of the faith. And it's important to note that for Paul, faith was considerably more an intellectual ascent or even an attitude of trust. Faith constituted for him a lifestyle of obedience. Everybody say lifestyle. So wherever he went, he presented the truth to which people should ascend, promises they should trust, and commands they should obey. His goal and desire was to bring people to the point where they would put their trust in Jesus Christ. So in addition to his view of his own special position and the purposes of God, he had an undying confidence in the relevance of the message that he desired to communicate. On numerous occasions, I don't know what your experience has been, but I have met salespeople who have been so enthusiastic about their products that they were convincing in their presentation. But often I've been amazed to discover that a few months later, many of them are working for their former competitors. Whenever I inquired about their abandonment of their former superlative product and their subsequent endorsement of what they previously regarded as inferior, I discovered that their commitment was more to the percentage that they would receive than the product. Paul could never be accused of that kind of behavior. He was unshakably loyal to the gospel of God. The Greek word euangelion was used to convey the excitement and thrill that he brought to his association with the good news. And the Greek translation of the Old Testament called the Septuagint, S-E-P-T-U-A-G-I-N-T, look it up. It is interesting to note that euangelion is the word used to describe the announcement of the end of the Babylonian captivity and the good news that the former captives were now free to return to their homeland where they had been exiled or from which they had been exiled for many, many years, 70 to be exact. The good news to which Paul was committed had a message even greater and grander, an exhilarating announcement that God, God's self, had procured liberty for people in spiritual bondage and created reconciliation for those in spiritual exile. So wherever he went, Paul saw him as the messenger of the kind of news that people needed to hear if they would ever become free to be the people that God created them to be. And there was always a criticism of Paul's message because if people are not criticizing you, it's because you ain't doing nothing. If you're doing something good, expect to be criticized. He was criticized wherever he went, but he took great pains to show his critics that far from being a fad, the message he was preaching was the one that God had promised before by his prophets in the scriptures. Using the only scriptures available to him in that day, the Old Testament Torah, Paul delighted to do what his master had done with the troubled disciples at Emmaus, beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning them himself. That's Luke 24, 27, speaking of Jesus. And the fact that Paul was able to show his critics that the gospel he preached was the fulfillment of what the prophets had predicted 
went a long way towards establishing his credibility as a message and his words as a messenger. The central point of his gospel was that to which the Old Testament had always pointed, because from the earliest promise of God to Eve that her seed would bruise the serpent's head, down through the torturous history of God's people, through whom the bruiser of Satan would come, the point of emphasis never changed. Through solemn festivals, innumerable sacrifices, the giving of the law, the deliverance from Egypt, God had spoken persistently through type, through symbol, through figure of the blessing to be made available through the one who was to come. Prophets who had bemoaned the condition of Israel had tempered their criticisms and sweetened their dire predictions with promises concerning one whose coming would bring in a new era of blessing. And nothing delighted Paul more than to take the scriptures and show that all of these things had come true in Jesus Christ. But his message did not center around a mere man, even a man of such royal status from the house of David, because Paul knew that the significance of the gospel of Jesus Christ lay in the person of Christ. Now, if Jesus were only a man, if he were only from the seed of David, his death was nobler than many and more gruesome than most, but nothing more. But the gospel of God has had as its central point one who was, in addition to being born of the seed of David, verse four, declared to be the son of God. Now the church of Christ has wrestled with the basic Christian doctrine that Jesus was human and holy all at the same time for centuries. In early years, church leaders wrote treatises on the subject, arguing endlessly about the meaning of the incarnation. The Gnostics, whom you may remember from a previous study we shared, believed that matter was essentially evil and spirit intrinsically good. They were appalled at the suggestion that God could inhabit human flesh because for them, the idea was so unthinkable that they went to great heights to avoid the conclusion that they had already rejected. Some insisted that the man Jesus was invested with the spirit as a dove at the time of his baptism, but that the spirit returned back to God before his crucifixion. Others maintain that when Christ was born, he passed through Mary like water passing through a tube. But try as they would, they were unable to avoid the clear statement of Paul and the strong teaching of John that an inexplicable miracle took place in which God assumed Galilean cloth, was tempted as we are, was touched by the feelings of our infirmities, and stooped to the point of bearing our sins in his own body on Calvary's tree. So having contrasted the seed of David with the Son of God, in verses three and four, Paul showed that the grounds for believing in the deity and humanity of Christ have to be clearly understood. For Christ, he said, was declared to be the Son of God. That word declared meant not only that a declaration was made about his deity, but that certain things happened that clearly established his deity. First of all, his position as the Son of God was established with power. Secondly, according to the spirit of holiness. And thirdly, by his resurrection from the dead. The extraordinary power of Jesus was exhibited in many instances as he conquered sin, death, disease, natural elements, spiritual forces of wickedness, and even Satan himself the powerful work of the Holy Spirit in whose blessed fullness he lived and through whose eternal enabling he was able to offer himself as a sacrifice was constant evidence of the uniqueness of his being. But my friends, it was ultimately his resurrection from the dead that both the power and the spirit were seen to the, have the greatest effect in his experience. Humanity had done its worst and taken Christ to death by the cross, placed him in the tomb, 
but God intervened and in a superlative display of the spirit had given heaven's best. Humanity's worst produced the dead savior. God's best produced the risen Lord. With arms outstretched, the Christ of Calvary had intercepted Saul on the road to Damascus and in living testimony to his risen power had exploded all of his objections and shown himself to be unequivocally the son of God. In his powerful explanation of the resurrection in the book of 1 Corinthians, Paul made this uncontestable statement. If Christ is not risen, then our preaching is in vain. In the ongoing proclamation of the gospel, he stated the converse, since Christ is risen, our preaching and our faith have validity. Because in the resurrection, God clearly placed before a watching world the unique son of God who was dead, but now lives in the power of an endless life. That Christ was alive, Paul never doubted. How could he, after being confronted by him on the Damascus Road, having no doubts about his resurrection, he had no doubts about Christ and the good news of God centered in the person and the work of the one whom he delighted to call his Lord. So having looked at his realistic assessment of himself, I want to move beyond that first point, my friends, and now focus on Paul's warm-hearted interest in people. You see it in verses 7 through 12 of Romans chapter 1. To all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son, that without ceasing, I make mention of you always in my prayers, making requests, if by some means, now at last, I may find a way in the will of God to come to you. For I long to see you, that I might impart to you some spiritual gift, so that you may be established, that is, that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. You know, it's not uncommon for a hard-driving personality like Paul to be singularly unsociable, driven as they are by hidden forces neither known nor desired by other people. Hard-driving people tend to isolate themselves from all but those who share their motivation or contribute to their goals. So it would not be surprising to discover that in Paul, an aloofness related to position and a detachment attributable to his vision but we are surprised pleasantly that this is not the case. While he was prepared to surrender his apostleship or not prepared to surrender it or to deviate from the sometimes unpleasant responsibilities that came with it, Paul displayed a great love for people without which any minister of Christ and any person who professes Christ is severely handicapped. Even in his formal greetings, picking up in verse seven, we are touched with a warmth that indicated his attitude towards believers he had never met. In the same way, he reveled in his own sense of calling, recognizing that they too were called. They shared a common calling, acknowledged a common Lord, and knew something of the privilege of being set apart for a common task, set apart for the gospel, called to be saints. In addition, both he and they were conscious that while God loves his entire creation, those who acknowledge his son are especially beloved of God. To Paul, it was obvious that he should develop a deep relationship with those with whom he shared so much. That's why he expressed himself as he did in verses eight through 12. Ever the evangelist, as well as the theologian and teacher, Paul loved to hear that the churches were actively engaged in the promotion of the gospel. This was certainly the case at Rome, where he says, your faith is spoken of throughout the entire world. The constant stream of people into Rome, no doubt circulated stories about the life and the witness of this remarkable group of believers 
who were centered in this city. It seems almost as if the church of the first century had a quality of life and a vitality of witness that made them the talking point in their environment. It may be a sad reflection on today's church that this is not always our experience. Neither might we add is the total lack of reservation in Paul's thanksgiving about their effectiveness. Not for him any questions about their integrity, any windows about their orthodoxy or similar disparaging remarks which one has almost come to expect from those who comment on fellowships outside their sphere of influence. He didn't have to entertain any of that. The fact that the Romans were not his converts and that the church at Rome was not one that he established or led didn't do anything to diminish his genuine delight in what God was doing in their midst. It is a bold step of maturity when you can arrive at the place where it's not about you, where you can rejoice in what God is doing in somebody else. This is a safeguard, my friends, against our own willfulness, not only in submission to God's will, but also in our commitment to the well-being of others. This was delightfully illustrated in Paul's words in verse 11. I long to see you, that I might impart to you some spiritual gift, so that you might be established. In the vertical dimension, he wanted to visit Rome to do God's will. But on a horizontal plane, his desire was to visit Rome to do them good, leaving little room for selfish desires. After years of ministry, Paul had still this insatiable desire to be with people and see them blessed. Goaded, a scriptural commentator says, a charisma or a gift is a concrete manifestation of grace. The epithet spiritual shows the nature and the source of the gift, which Paul hopes to impart to those who would read this epistle. As we point out in his traditional greeting, he expressed the desire that grace and peace should be the experience of those to whom he wrote. But when he used these terms, he invested the traditional with spiritual content because he genuinely wanted them to experience God's grace through the exercise of their spiritual gifts in the fellowship. So for Paul, formality gave way to practicality as he made plans to exercise and share with these believers in Rome the gift of the spirit with which he had been entrusted. Now, of course, we must be careful to know that the exercise of spiritual gifts always takes place with a very definite objective that people would be strengthened and that they would be established. There can be a tendency among those who believe for people who have spiritual gifts to use them to entertain, intrigue, fascinate, or amuse. And this is a gross abuse. When gifted people use their gifts, they should always use them to the glory of God. Notice that Paul puts this delightful touch on his concluding message here in verse 12. It's a transparently honest statement where he says that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith of both you and me. Don't miss that because this great apostle intent on ministering in Rome using his gift for their benefit was careful to let them know that his coming was not only going to result in their benefit, but also in his blessing. No doubt would they be blessed by his ministry, but they may have never considered that they could help him. And that is the essence of Christian life, that we are blessed to bless others. That's my primary point. So let me move on to Paul's enthusiastic commitment to his work because human frailties have to be recognized in all human endeavors. People get tired, say amen. People get discouraged, type amen. People get bored, type Lord have mercy. And people get a disillusioned with the result that both they and the work to which they have been called suffer. At the time of this writing, Paul was actively engaged in his ministry and had been so for 30 years hectic 
energy sapping years. He had endured enough hardship been exposed to enough trauma to last most people for half a dozen lifetimes. Great triumphs had attended his labor, but persistent problems had dogged his steps. Nevertheless, his enthusiasm had not abated. Somebody type, hold on to your excitement. As we read in this text of his plans to travel to Rome, it's easy for us to forget he was almost 60, but such is the vigor and vision of his thought and expression. Look at verses 13 through 17. He said, now I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often planned to come to you, but was hindered until now, that I might have some fruit among you also, just as among the other Gentiles. I am debtor to both Greeks and barbarians, wise and unwise. So as much as it is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. It is possible that the Roman Christians had expressed some concern to Paul that this apostle to the Gentiles, which is how he described himself, had not seen fit to visit this greater Gentile center, the city of Rome. Paul must have been the most anxious to assure his colleagues there that his failure to show up in the city was certainly not by design, but the result of circumstances beyond his control his desire to have fruit among them, as he had in other cities, was as deep and as enduring as his sense of calling to non-Hebraic people the world over. In fact, he labored under a great sense of obligation, seeing himself, as he describes himself in verse 14, as a debtor both to the Greeks and the barbarians, the wise and the unwise. There's something almost frightening in the intensity of his statement about being a debtor. He recognized that his blessings had brought with them an obligation. It is as if he felt that God revealed the gospel to him, not so much for his own benefit as for the benefit of others. A situation not unlike that of a trustee to whom securities are entrusted by an elderly grandparent, a mother or father, for the benefit of minor grandchildren as yet too immature to handle their own financial affairs. To the degree to which and in which the trustee holds the securities in his or her own name, they are indebted to the one for whom they are to be made ultimately available. Paul's compelling sense of indebtedness to God for his grace and to people because of his ministry meant that he was never free to feel that the work belonged to him or that his work was ever done. I need you to remind somebody sharing this study in the chat space right now and just type for them, your work is not done. It's hard to imagine how Paul was able to live with such a constant load of spiritual responsibility. And yet at the same time, it's harder to grasp how many believers are able to live without one, without any sense of obligation. The fact that Paul placed no limits on his ministry in the sense that he endeavored to reach all types of people is a major significance. He felt obligated to minister to everybody. That's a big ticket. That means those who had exposure to all types of culture, those without exposure, those who were sophisticated and those who were utterly devoid of any education. Paul felt called to everybody. And in these days of more and more specialization, it is perhaps necessary for us to remind ourselves that we are called to reach people in general, not exclusively people of our own kind. Paul, the educated and sophisticated product of Tarsus, would no doubt have felt much more in common with the Greeks and the wise than the barbarians and the unwise, but to him, this was of no consequence. If they were people, 
That was all he needed to know. And that's all we need to know, that we are called by Jesus Christ to reach every possible person by every possible means in every possible place at every possible time with the loving, life-giving message of the grace of Almighty God expressed through Jesus Christ. Because on top of his obligation rested an eagerness to share the gospel with everybody. You see it in verse 15. I'm sure that we know ourselves and others well enough to recognize that the obligated people of this world are not necessarily the most eager people under the sun. In fact, a sense of obligation often produces a disgruntled attitude and a minimal acceptance of any responsibility, but not so for this apostle. He was desperately anxious to share the gospel, to evangelize, to euangelion in the city of Rome well as well. It is worth noting that his objective was to go much further than just to encourage and establish the church, but also to proclaim the gospel to those outside the fellowship of faith. When was the last time you shared Jesus with somebody who has no idea who he is? Warming to this theme in the text, Paul went on to insist that he was not ashamed of the gospel. Not that anyone ever had grounds for thinking that he might be. Why should he be ashamed of a message which was to him so obviously the power of God and the salvation? This Greek word, sophiria, meaning salvation, is related to the English acronym SOS, meaning safe and sound reminding us that God has made available to human beings through Christ the possibility of spiritual safety and holistic soundness. Safety for all eternity, soundness for life. Why, reason Paul, should anyone be deferential or apologetic about that kind of message, particularly when it was not just an enchanting philosophical concept, but a reality backed by nothing less and the power of Almighty God. In his travels, he had seen God's power work through the gospel, making every conceivable type of person safe and sound. So without hesitation, he proclaimed this gospel as a powerful, life-changing agent for everyone who believes, verse 16, for the Jew first, but also for the Greek. And marvelous as it is that the gospel is a means of blessing all of humankind, Paul was careful to alert those reading his epistle that the gospel was also the means whereby the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. From a purely human point of view, it's understandable that the interests of human beings in the gospel may be limited initially to what God is prepared to do for people. But the gospel, my friends, goes beyond that, beyond what God will do for you and will do for me, but reveals what God is like as well as what God is willing to give. It demonstrates who God is as well as what God does. The righteousness of God, which the gospel reveals, is an expression so full of meaning that it would be true to say that the rest of this epistle of Romans is designed to try to explain it. At this juncture, we'll content ourselves with the understanding that the righteousness of God in Romans means primarily that God is always in the right. Somebody say it out loud wherever you are. God is always in the right and God can be relied upon, therefore, to do what is right for the simple reason that what is right can be determined only by reference to God, flowing from the fact that God will always be in the right, Paul explained how the gospel reveals the way in which God makes people who are in the wrong to be in the right without jeopardizing his own righteousness. How does it come about? I'm glad you asked. By faith. Everybody type in the chat space, by faith. That's what Paul insists as he quotes Habakkuk 2.4, that the just shall live by faith. 
He's giving us a reminder that we are justified, meaning made right, just as if I'd never done anything wrong. We are made right by faith in order that having been made right by faith, we might live right by faith. Or as Paul expressed it in verse 17, we might move from faith to faith. That is to be our attitude, a conquering attitude that sets us up for victory in all of life. And as we'll see moving forward, Paul has slipped out of his introduction by verse 17 into the main theme of his teaching, more than conquerors, and we have slipped with him. But before we go on, can I remind you that these introductory verses radiate with the beauty of the apostle's attitude towards himself, his message, his brothers and sisters, and his work. They not only present great insight into who the apostle Paul was, but they confront us today at the beginning of Lent to face our own attitudes and to ask ourselves, is my attitude the attitude of one who overcomes or one being overcome? Am I a victor or am I a victim? Because God's word to you is that you in Jesus Christ are more than a conqueror. Stay tuned. It's going to get better. God bless you real good.